Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, visual concepts at the very beginning, uh, elements of design, right? To start this out, we've just got to go through our very basic uh, start at the beginning um, elements so that we know how that we are forming things as we move forward, whether it be in scenery, lighting, costumes, uh, etc. So, our seven basic elements of design are line, color, shape, space, texture, value, and form. I'll go through all of those. Each one of them could definitely be uh, an entire class period, if not a semester in and of itself. So I'm gonna move through things relatively quickly. Uh, but this is our, uh, our, our basic uh, seven elements. Oops, that was the wrong one. Great, so what is a line? Element of art used to define the sh uh, shape, contours, and outlines, also to suggest mass and volume. It may be a continuous mark made on the surface with a pointed tool or implied by the edges of shapes and other forms. We'll go into that in a second. If you guys have questions, ask, but it should be relatively straightforward. We've all seen these things before. Okay, so <coughs> characteristics of lines. Width, length, direction, focus, feeling, we, right? We've all, we all know what these are, just the ad adjectives of, of what we're looking at. So width, is it thick, is it thin, does it taper, is it uneven? Uh, length, again. Long, short, continuous, broken. All of these things come into when we start doing things like scenic drafting, right? And we start dealing with line ways, how thick the line is. Is it a hidden line so it's dashed? Is it a center line so it's long, short, long, dashed? All of that's gonna play back into um, all of the things, ways that we're gonna visually represent our designs and what we're gonna ultimately put on stage. Uh, directional, again, horizontal, vertical, diagonal. Is it curved? Is it perpendicular to itself? Is it oblique? Is it parallel? Focus, is it sharp? Is it blurry? Is it fuzzy? Uh, feeling is the most subjective of all of them, but things like, is it sharp? Is it jagged? Is, does it visually evoke some sort of emotion in you as you're moving forward? Anything that you can do to kind of describe these things because we work in such subjective terms so often. So here we have uh, some examples of some line variations, right? A and B, they're all basically the same things, played out in different uh, formats, dots versus solid, horizontal lines versus solid structure, uh, perpendicular versus oblique, jagged, squiggly, BBS kind of at the point. Uh, types of lines, so on our, in its most basic form, an outline, right? We've all seen this before, right? This is the little, this one's getting a little smaller because it's melting, <laughs> um, but, um, Essentially, we've created the, um, the shape of the continents as we know them to be, and we can all see this and, and do a very quick visual representation and connection that, hey, that's Australia, I know what it is from the shape. By doing this outline in this form, we also create the negative space of the bodies of water. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, contour lines. Uh, the lines that describe a shape of an object uh, and the interior detail that it has, right? So we have this pair of chucks because we know that our friend Jenna Link loves chucks um, and, uh, and wears them daily. So not necessarily an outline of the whole thing, but by the contours, we've created the shape within that. Gesture lines. Lines that are energetic and catch movement of gestures or an active figure, right? Think cartoons. Um, think we just closed a production of Pippin that was very Marvel-esque in its nature, right? So think comic books, think graphic novels, any of those things that give a very dynamic movement to this person on their knees reaching up for ice cream, I don't know. <laughs> uh, great, sketch lines. Lines that capture the appearance of an object or an impression of a place, right? We very obviously have some sort of uh, grand cathedral space uh, or archway here, none of it's very defined, but it's all sketched out in a way that it, we can very simply identify what we're looking at. Again, going into uh, a design element for theater, if we're talking about a scenic design, okay, we can very clearly, I'm not gonna build anything off of this drawing, but I have a very clear idea of what a designer's going for, what we're looking for, what the feel of it is, and it's something that a director can respond to. It's also something that a lighting designer can respond to and say, ooh, there's gonna be all kinds of really fantastic columns that I can shoot around, that I can shoot through, and I can create shadows if there's gonna be shadow play. Um, all off of a very simple sketch. 
Uh, calligraphic lines, right? Calligraphy uh, from the Greek beautiful writing. Right? We've all seen fantastic calligraphy. My wife has does it fantastically. I can barely write my own name. Um, but is uh, it's just elegant uh, in and of itself in terms of the lines are very dynamic, they're very soft, they change um, in their line weight from thick to thin, but it conveys the picture or, in this case, uh, a Japanese character. Implied lines, uh, lines that are not actually drawn but created by a group of objects seen from a distance. Uh, it's, look, it's the direction an object is pointing to or the direction a person is looking at. So here we have a deer. We clearly haven't actually drawn a deer, but a series of implied lines that when we step back and look at it, right, we have a deer. Okay, moving forward, just in terms of feed, if you guys have questions, let me know. But I'm well seen this before. <laughs> okay, color. So uh, this is where things get a little bit tricky in our world. Right? Because color comes from light. Right? Without light, we don't see anything, and we certainly uh, don't see color. Uh, we can see the spectrum of light as it goes through a prism, right? which is essentially what a rainbow is. If you think about that, that's light hitting water vapor in a specific angle that it breaks apart, and we see those different colors that we represent or we know of as the colors of the rainbow. We could get into a whole long existential debate about does color even exist? We're not gonna go there. We're not gonna do that right now. So here is uh, our, a very basic color wheel, right? This is what we've all dealt with since we were in kindergarten. The part that gets tricky about it is are we talking about pigment or are we talking about light? Uh, and that, as we know, has to do with the difference in primary colors, right? Yellow and blue have always made what? Green in our lives until we get to lighting and green is a primary color. And when we get into lighting, we'll, you know, and going further into that, uh, we'll do a whole thing where we will mix green light and red light together and get yellow. And won't that be fantastic? Um, and a little bit magical. But yeah, it's very strange. It's not, it's, it's very counterintuitive to what you've been taught your entire lives. Uh, but you have to acknowledge the fact that the thing that's allowing you to discern that is actually different in and of itself. Uh, so, within our color wheel, we have our primary colors, we just talked about that. We have our secondary colors, right, which are two primaries mixed together. And we have our tertiary colors, which is the third one, which are the secondaries mixed with the primaries. Uh, in terms of how we get to our basic um, three-level structured color wheel. Once we get beyond that, it gets more complicated than we uh, generally deal with. But in terms of the mixing and what something is going to look like, we know if we mix red and blue, we are going to get purple, depending on the level of pure pigment that we introduce into that mixture at any given time. Uh, okay, color harmonies. Uh, essentially, things that are together uh, on a color wheel, like red, red orange, orange, yellow, those are all grouped right together in that color wheel. Right? They're very harmonious in nature, and we have a nice picture of the inside of a flower. Uh, but it all goes together, and uh, doesn't contrast itself at all. <coughs> triadic. Uh, our triadic harmonies are three equally spaced colors uh, on a color wheel. For, so for example, yellow, red, and blue, right, in this instance. Much more contrast to it. Really makes, uh, makes the fish pop, uh, but still has a, a visual harmony to it uh, in and of itself. Monochromatic, right, single color, essentially. Uh, we have, in this case, yellow clocks, and this really has to do with the value of the color as we move through that. We'll talk about value later on. It's a little bit ethereal and, and sometimes a little bit hard to grasp, but think at its most basic level, grayscale, right? How dark and light, how contrasting something is, how much pure spectral hue is part of an actual color. So, we, oh, hello, that's exciting. Um, so these are, are very different uh, and defined right next to each other, but we can see that they essentially they are all yellow for some form of color. And um, what yeah. sort of hue did you say that was? Oh, how much pure spectral hue. So how much, um, how much of the primary color is existent in it along a grayscale? Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so the color of harmonies, warm and cool, right? We have our warm colors, our yellows, our reds, things like that. Uh, coolers are the blues, the purples, that sort of thing. Uh, it's important to keep in mind from a design standpoint that from a sociological point of view, we reference these things emotionally uh, and in, intrinsically in our heads because we know that you know warm colors are tend to be more aggressive, right? What color is a stop sign? Right. Red. Stop. You know, it's it's a very aggressive thing. The blues, the purples uh, are softer. Important to know as you move forward, though, that those color interpretations are going to differ widely between cultures, and you have to be cognizant of that in terms of either presenting something to those cultures or representing something within them. Right? For example, uh, Asian cultures, especially China, purple is a very <coughs> regal color. Right? The, the royal families are the only ones wearing purple, so we can't put the peasant boy in the purple shirt. That kind of thing. Uh, that's where the research comes in and, and all the other fun learning that we get to do along the way. Uh, value. Here's our grayscale, right? How white to black, where does that fall um, in, in terms of that scale within a specific color, within that yellow that we saw with the clocks? <clears throat> okay, shape. Uh, so when a line crosses itself or intersects with our lines uh, to enclose a space, it creates a shape. Uh, shape is two-dimensional and it has a height and a width, but no depth, right? We're watching TV, it's all two-dimensional, unless we get into the 3D nonsense, but uh, generally speaking, um, we're dealing with two-dimensional images. When we do a visual form here, we're dealing with three-dimensional forms uh, in the theater, and so have to be aware of either A, how to represent those, or B, how those are affected by the elements that we are putting into the space. So, uh, geometric shapes, right? Basic, what, sixth grade geometry? Probably, probably earlier than that. We have squares, we have rectangles, we have triangles, we have parallelograms, um, all of those fancy Greek names. Uh, organic shapes, right? Think things in nature, right? So this is things like leaves, seashells, animal contours, right? They're gonna be much softer um, and, and not have as many of the jagged edges, although I suppose it could be argued that there are things that, in nature that are very jagged. Positive versus negative. Uh, this is something that we can really use to our advantage sometimes. Um, so best example here is our scissors. This is the positive space. It's been drawn in, it's been applied, it's something that is there. As opposed to the handles of the scissors essentially appear negatively. We've cut them out of all the scribbling that we've done. Uh, where this can help is in, um, in dealing with more complex shapes. Sometimes it's actually faster and easier to draw the negative space than it is to draw something out in a positive manner, right? So I've got this thing and I've got this thing. Uh, how do I draw them in relationship to each other? Draw the space in between them. They'll start to define themselves and that whole image will start to create more shape, right? Classic pop culture examples. Once you see it, you'll never be able to not see it. The arrow and the FedEx sign. Sorry about you. Welcome to the club. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and Abigail for the win, who has never noticed this before. I never know. Okay. And you and you will never be able to not see. I it. can't unsee it now. No. Okay. You, you will see FedEx on the freeway, and you will see the arrow from now on. Right. Same thing with our NBC Peacock. We knew uh, that one. We knew that one. <laughs> We've seen that one since we were small children. Um, but yes, fantastic example of using negative space uh, within a brand, within a logo. You sit with that one for a minute? You yeah. <laughs> okay, static and dynamic. Uh, static, uh, basically uh, shapes that appear stable, that are resting, they're in one place, right? These squares are solid, they're not going anywhere. Um, there's not any, what we might even think of as digital noise, right? There isn't any movement to them. Whereas dynamic, these ones over here, a little bit more randomly placed, but in such a way that we move through them visually quite a bit. Right? They've, they've got some sort of dynamic notion to them uh, and, and how those things affect us. Okay, again, very static, very peaceful, seaside, sit there anywhere. Uh, whereas 
because we have a tsunami wave, right? Much more dynamic. We can see uh, the motion. We can we know what's going on with these boats. Uh, there's about to have these guys down here. These fellows are about to have a real bad day. They're gonna get real wet. Um, but we know exactly what's gonna happen. Um, great. So negative space. Uh, surrounds a sculpture or an object. A person can walk around sculptures and objects, look above them, and enter them. Space which refers to the space inside, around, and above a sculpture or an object. Three-dimensional object with positive space will have a height, weight, width, and depth to it, right? Because three dimensions. Uh, the two-dimensional drawing or painting refers to an arrangement of objects uh, on the picture plane. The picture plane is a surface of your drawing paper or canvas. Two-dimensional piece of art that has a height and weight but no depth and the illusion of depth can be achieved through perspective. We're gonna get into that in just a, little, uh, in a minute. Again, we could do an entire semester on perspective and how that works. Uh, the most basic example in terms of thinking about it from a theatrical standpoint is uh, so often we will do a forced perspective <clears throat> even just with our legs and borders, right? We'll bring each one of them in a little bit more than the last one. Borders will come in and will basically force our eye further back. Perspective is the technique that's used to create the illusion of depth in your picture. Perspective makes your picture look like it is moving in the distance like a landscape or a sunscape. So again, just some more visual examples of positive negative space uh, within a three-dimensional structure. Here we get into a little bit more perspective. Again, we're all kind of sketched out. This is much more uh, detailed, obviously, but again, it's not something we're going to build off of, but it definitely has a representation of what we're trying to achieve. Okay, And composition. Uh, I like this image a lot because it starts to bring together all of the other individual forms that we've already talked about, right? We have very specific lines with the Eiffel Tower uh, and what that structure is. We've got positive and negative space um, cut out between it. We've got very geometric shapes in our um, uh, in the tile layout, we've got more organic shapes in the face in, in the clouds. We're representing a couple of different color option uh, ideas here, um, monochromatic in and of themselves, but very contrasting together. So <coughs> you can see how all of our basic individual elements starting to come together in one image makes something relatively dynamic and interesting. Perspective. Uh, so we have. Um, Right? This person is obviously very close. This person is much farther away. Um, for those of you who are fans of Middle Earth, right? this is the idea of filming things like The Hobbit right? or any of the Lord of the Rings when we're having to deal with characters that are meant to be uh, appear much smaller or much shorter uh, than their counterparts. That kind of forced perspective, especially in a two-dimensional form like film, really comes into play and we can, we can do some of those camera angles. So a single point perspective, uh, we're all very familiar with, uh, with this painting. Uh, I don't know, that, that's a guy. Uh, he did a thing once. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, <laughs> more to the point, uh, it is single point perspective. Um, sorry, I lost my space in my notes. Um, where lines are created by an edge or the shape of a building that are pointing into the distance that are meeting at one point on the horizon. You're gonna see what I mean in a second when we go to multi-point perspective. But essentially, all of these lines are all angling back to one point in the horizon line further back behind his head, right? It's all disappearing back to a single point. Whereas when we have two-point perspective, right? Our building is very large coming out to us from the front. It's clearly going away from us here and our, our vanishing points are off to the sides. Again, there's a whole semester to be done entirely on perspective. But again, you can see how the basic structures of these different forms that we're going through laid on top of each other um, start to create a pretty dynamic Im image pretty quickly. Uh, so that's the end of the fun images. The other one that I really wanted to talk to you guys about is texture, right? Uh, I don't have any good images of texture, unfortunately, but uh, we're talking about the surface quality of an object, right? So this table in and of itself is very smooth, okay? Uh, from a theatrical standpoint, we do a really interesting mix of, um, of real texture and implied texture, right? Real being something that you can feel is smooth or is rough. And we've created three-dimensional bricks 
um, that we can spread light across or are very representational of what we're doing. Or from the implied um, texture, we do a whole lot of painting wood to look like wood uh, in the theater, right? Or painting metal to look like metal, uh, which is in itself kind of ironic. Um, but all of those things combined, uh, I know this has been just a real quick running through, but especially in that photo uh, that we saw in Paris, um, will give you an idea how taking all of the relatively simple forms that we think about um, can be combined into one thing, uh, into one image by laying them on top of each other in a fairly dynamic way. And so it all becomes a little bit less daunting if we can break it down into its component parts. Okay? Yep. Thanks very much, everybody.